Thank you for joining us for our program, Florence Price Renaissance Woman. My name is Helen Liu and I am the Programming and Partnerships Manager at Cary Library. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to thank the Cary Library Foundation. Their support enables us to bring programs like today's event to you. This program is in partnership with the Association of Black Citizens of Lexington, ABCL. This program is being recorded and will be posted to the library's YouTube channel. If you have any questions, please submit them to the Q&A. Reggie Gibson will be our moderator today. Reggie has lectured and performed widely in the US, Cuba, and Europe. In Italy, representing the US, Reggie competed for and was awarded the Absolute Poetry Award and the Europa Inversi Prize. He has served as a consultant from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Mayor Distinction of Color exhibit at James Madison Montpelier Home. He's received the Walker Scholarship for Poetry from the Provincetown Fine Arts Work Center, a YMCA Writers Fellowship, a Mass Cultural Council Poetry Award, a Lexington Education Foundation grant, a Brother Thomas Fellowship, and two Live Arts Boston grants to develop his first play, The Juke, a Blues Baki, which uses elements of the Rapidian <laughs> strategy to explore African American music, history, and spirituality. He is regularly featured on NPR and other radio media and is a creative in residence at the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center, Hague, Netherlands, working to craft language regarding issues of climate change. He is the creator of the Shakespeare Time Traveling Speakeasy, a multimedia literary concert focused on the works and influence of William Shakespeare which will be performed at Cary Library on May 7th and is the former poet in residence at Cary Memorial Library. He currently teaches at Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts. Reggie, welcome. I am now going to hand the program off to you to introduce our special guest today, Dr. Samantha Eggett. Thank you so much, Helen. And thanks to the Cary Memorial Library for being in partnership with us to put this on. I'm a member of the ABCL, the Association of Black Citizens of Lexington, and it is a pleasure to be with you all today and to bring into our midst a towering talent and interpreter of music, Dr. Samantha Ege. I am going to read to you from her very um, illustrious bio, and then we're going to have conversation and hear some music from Dr. Ege. Uh, that she has, she has interpreted for us. Dr. Samantha Ege is the Lord Crew Junior Research Fellow in Music at Lincoln College, University of Oxford. She holds a PhD in musicology from the University of York and a BA with honors in music from the University of Bristol. She spent her second undergraduate year at McGill University in Canada as an exchange student. She taught music internationally for almost a decade after graduating from Bristol and then joined Lincoln College in 2020. Dr. Ege is a leading interpreter and scholar of the African-American composer Florence B. Price. Uh, she, her performances and publications shed an important light on the composers of, of underrepresented backgrounds. And in 2021, she received the American Musicological Society's Noah Greenberg Award for her recording project on five female composer pianists from the Black Renaissance era. In 2019, she received both the Society of American Music's Eileen Southern Fellowship and Newberry Library Short-Term Residential Fellowship for her work on women's contributions to concert life in interwar Chicago. Interwar would be the period between World War, the end of World War I and 1939, I believe. Dr. Ege's first book is called South Side Impresarios, Race, well, Race Women in the Realm of Music, and that's under University of Illinois Press. She has been contracted uh, to co-author uh, alongside Douglas Shadow, uh, a book on price as well, and also to co-edit a book with Corey Hill of the Cambridge Companion to Florence Price, Cambridge University Press. Now, as a concert pianist, Dr. Ege made her Barbican debut in 2021, in which she gave uh, the UK premiere of, I think her last name is Karapolova's Sonata Appassionata, and in her London debut in the night in 2021 London Festival of American Music, she gave the world premiere of Florence Price's uh, Complete, and I'm not even going to 
him to pronounce this. We're going to hear it later and she'll help us pronounce this because my French is horrible. <laughs> but it was done from Florence Price in 2018. And she made her international lecture recital debut in Chicago, at the Chicago Symphony Center with her event, A Celebration of Women in Music. I love that because I'm also from, from Chicago. So I'd like to hear more about her experiences with that. So with all of that said, would you please join me in giving a true Lexington, Massachusetts welcome to Dr. Samantha Ege. Welcome aboard, Dr. Ege. Thank you. It's really an honor to join you virtually. Um, we had hoped that I might actually be in town around this time, but um, you know, travel plans change in this mm -hmm. kind of climate. So I'm glad we've been able to work things out virtually and I'm able to share um, the exciting things that I'm working on with you all. That is that is great. It's kind of you to, to be here. Um, it is um, listening to to your interpretation of, of the music is for me very, very thrilling. I'm a more of a, what I call myself a literary musician <laughs> than I am an actual playing musician. I sort of hear um, things that happen in music more than I can actually read it and actually play it. And I want to ask you maybe a first question is what does it mean to interpret music? I think to interpret music is to be a storyteller. And with every piece that I play, every composer that I program, um, and every program note that I, I write, um, there is always such a personal story behind, behind that work. And so my interpretations um, will vary over time because as a human being, I, I change. Um, and it's as we talk a little bit more about the music, I'll be telling you about pieces um, that I've been playing for years, pieces that mm. I've recorded before. And with each interpretation, I, I bring something different because with each day I, I you know, I grow, I become something different. So it, it's definitely about being a storyteller um, mm -hmm. and telling something of yourself as well as of the um, of the lives of the the composers. Yeah, thank thank you for that because it sounds it sounds very similar to to what might happen in 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 literature, where we might receive a particular story, but but we focus on different aspects of what that story might be to sort of to sort of grow it. And some days, as we relate to art, right, there's a part of us that pulls to a particular part of it, and then we grow, and then there's something we hear in it that we did not that we didn't focus on before. It might have just grazed past us, but we focus on it differently. And um, thought about that when I was thinking about the title of what we're going to see see next are uh, you introducing your album black renaissance woman right when i when uh i was younger and in, in in what i call suffering from the disease of my 20s i found a mentor named kent foreman who said there are two things about you and i young man he says we are black we are male we are poets and he says now you got to figure out what those three things mean to you and try to figure out how they live together mm -hmm. Right. I'm asking maybe maybe you have some insight on that. You have black renaissance and woman. I'm assuming that there's that there's a huge part of you that, of course, you relate to all of that. And I'm imagining you, you perhaps see yourself also through through that lens. Do you have maybe any insight from your travels as being black renaissance and woman as to what those three things may mean and how you reconcile bringing all of those together? Yes. Well, the idea for this title Black Renaissance Woman stemmed from the work that I was doing on Florence Price. So this is me with my historian hat on. Um, Price was from the Black Renaissance era. So this is an era of social rebirth, of cultural transformation. Renaissance, as many of you will know, means rebirth. You know, it's the idea of that rejuvenation. So this is a really, really exciting time in the first half of the 20th century that's unfolding across all of these major cities in the United States and Chicago and Harlem and so many others are experiencing a cultural renaissance. What's really fascinating about Florence Price's context is that there's a whole network of women around her facilitating this renaissance. So we this know- This is in her, Chicago, you're speaking. Yes. So we know her as the first African-American woman to achieve major success as a composer, national and international success. We know her as the first African-American woman to have a symphony performed by a major national orchestra, which was the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Yeah. What not all of us know is that um, a black woman called Maud Roberts George paid for that to happen. She sponsored that performance. She underwrote the contract with the conductor so that this all white, all male orchestra 
could champion Price's work on the global concert stage. So uh -huh. Black Renaissance Woman captures that era. It acknowledges race, it acknowledges gender, it acknowledges the cultural rebirth. Now, with my album, focusing on not just Florence Price, but her peers and her successors, Margaret Bonds, Nora Holt, Helen Hagen, and Betty Jackson King, I could have called the album Black Renaissance Women. And I knew that sometimes, um, you know, people might mistake uh, the, you know, whether it's woman or women, and that, that has happened. But I was adamant that it be Black Renaissance Women, because this is my story too. And I identify this period in my life as rebirth, um, as, as personal transformation. I never envisioned that I could be a classical pianist that almost exclusively championed Black women composers. And yet here I am playing at the Barbican, um, playing at Birmingham Symphony Hall, playing in the United States, all around the world, making my Irish debut just last week. Um, and this is playing music that, um, you know, wasn't, isn't supposed to be heard in the classical mm -hmm, mainstream. Mm -hmm. This is music that's been suppressed. And yet I have found such strength, such empowerment. And so I wanted to go with the singular Black Renaissance Woman mm -hmm. because it's a way for me to um, become more involved with this music. I think Black Renaissance Women, plural, creates a sense of distance. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The singular mm -hmm. sort of brings us all together. And if not for these women, I certainly wouldn't have the, the, the richness of, of life that I have right now. So... That's the story behind behind that Thank title. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that that with us. And with that, um, we are going to show, if technology will allow, we are going to show um, a segment that you have called Black Renaissance Woman, and uh, you're going to do some more explanation and and take us into a bit of the world of that. So thank you. Um, if we can play Black Renaissance Woman, that would be great. Thank you. The theme of this album is, as the title says, Black Renaissance Women. It's about African-American women who really came into their own in the first half of the 20th century. The Black Renaissance is an era of cultural rebirth and that translates into the music that we hear. It's an album that reflects the empowerment of women at this time. I think of the Black Renaissance as an era in the same way that I would the Romantic era or the Baroque era. I'm really interested in the underheard voices of women in music, especially around the first half of the 20th century. And so as I was looking into this era, I found that not only were there um, individuals composing such brilliant music around this time, but individuals that really knew each other. And this album really delves into that community and it shows the ways in which they collaborated. Um, it shows how they influenced each other stylistically. And so this is about recognizing um, roots as well as celebrating accomplishments. With this music that you hear by Florence Price, Margaret Bonds, Nora Holt, Betty Jackson King, and Helen Hagen, you're really hearing a community of female composers who were incredibly empowered and had a lot to say. The piece by Florence Price that's on this album is her piano concerto in one movement arranged for two pianos. And one of the things that I absolutely love about this piece is that she would perform it with Margaret Bonds, who's another composer on this album. In fact, the music that you can hear in the background is her troubled water. And so there are real narratives of sisterhood, of connection, of uplift, of empowerment. And that's really what this album is about. 
I think of Margaret Bonds as a daughter of the Black Renaissance. Her mother's home was one in which so many composers and performers and teachers would pass through and they would stay with Margaret Bonds and they would teach her. A lot of what she says as a composer really reflects this dynamic environment that she grew up in. It's really exciting to present the first recording of Helen Hagen's Piano Concerto in C minor. She composed this in 1912, which is when she was studying at Yale. So if you can imagine, um, a black woman studying at Yale at that time really shows that she must have made her mark on the classical music scene. And unfortunately, it's the only piece of hers that survives, so it really means a lot to, to bring this piece to life more than a century later. With Nora Holt, the fabulous Nora Holt, I never know where to begin. Um, the more I learn about her, the more I'm just blown away by the incredible life that she led. Her life was, in many ways, very modern. She really lived by her own rules. The only piece for piano solo that survives is a piece called Negro Dance, and that piece is with us today because she published it herself in a journal that she created called Music and Poetry. Like Margaret Bonds, Betty Jackson King was also a daughter of the Black Renaissance. Her mother was deeply involved in classical music making and really instilled a sense of, um, of musical passion and, and pride in one's work um, within Betty Jackson King. And with her four seasonal sketches, what I'm really drawn to is the way in which she so vividly paints these impressions of the seasons. And she does so with a very broad musical palette. Each composer, Florence Price, Margaret Bonds, Nora Holt, Betty Jackson King and Helen Hagen have their own voice and yes I'm bringing them into conversation with one another but you can hear their distinct identities in their music and this album really is a celebration of the, the variety um, housed in the Black Renaissance era. I think what this album shows is that there is a much larger history waiting to be told and when people hear this music I hope that they are inspired to learn more and maybe even to find more as well so that we can continue to to shed light on this history and shed light on its music as well. Um, Dr. Ege, if you ever, uh, if you feel like, like, you know, calling you Dr. Ege is too much, just let me know. Oh uh, yeah, sometimes, Sam you know, when, is fine. <laughs> okay, because I'm, I'm like you, when people say wonderfully beautiful, talented and powerful black man, I know who they mean, right? And, and, but I don't, they don't have to call me that all the time. So, so if, if you're saying Samantha's fine and I want to give you your propers because getting a doctorate and what you got a doctorate is not an easy thing. So I am okay to call you that, but Samantha, Samantha, I would love to do that if that's okay with you. And yes. sometimes I'll slip back into the, into the deferential <laughs> Dr. Agay though. Um, Thank you for, for putting all of that together. We, it says seven minutes and some, but we know it was more than seven minutes. That's what it got reduced to, right? And so how do, you, you clearly kept yourself fresh and up and, and focused and all of that through the whole thing. And it, it's enough to bring, to bring us into it. I myself can't wait you know, to get the album. I have two, two other albums of yours, but I can't wait to get, to get that album. I wanna ask you if, you, if you might, is there anything um, in that segment that, that, that you would have wanted to say or maybe got taken out? that that um that you can tell us now um not so much what i would want to say but i i would want to have to have you here 
all the music, <laughs> which is obviously <laughs> that's what the album is for. Um, right. But with um, with the recordings, there are pieces that um, haven't been heard before that haven't been recorded. Um, right. And so, for example, one of them is the Helen Hagen piano concerto arranged for two pianos because to to have an orchestra is is not um an easy thing to do but to be a black woman in 1912 right um trying to secure an an, an orchestra um could at times be near impossible so it wasn't uncommon for composers to write a concerto which is uh, for a solo instrument and an orchestra and right. to rewrite the orchestral part for a piano because it Pianos, you know, most people had a piano in the home. If you've got maybe two upright pianos, they don't take up too much space. Mm -hmm. So to have um, these works arranged for two pianos was a very common thing. But I think it took on special significance for Black women because this was a way for them to have their voices be heard mm -hmm. or for people to really understand just what they were capable of. You know, the, right. these arrangements were a form of self-advocacy. And so I really, it was so important to me to record this music um, as Helen Hagen would have played it with another pianist. That was so wonderful what you said, music as a, as a form of self-advocacy, right? The, the, the idea that, that perhaps you're in a society that doesn't give your voice, your actual physical voice, a chance to be heard, right? But, 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 but the music itself becomes this thing through which you are being heard and understood. And you put a lot, of, a lot into that. And I've never really thought about that as, of course, I always think about it as a form of expression, but, but you frame that for me beautifully as a form of self-advocacy. And I don't think I've ever quite thought about it that way. Thank you for that. And, and thank you for bringing me Helen Hagen, who I had previously never, never heard of. I'd never heard, heard of her, but, but um, thank you for, for bringing that to light. Um, what I would like to ask, if, if we have the time for this, maybe we do, is that you mentioned about the stories of women. I was wondering, and how the music also displays it, I was wondering with, with these five women who, whose work you are, you're bringing to us, is there a quick... Um, something you can give us that made them to you extraordinary, either in how they interpreted music, maybe two sentences or whatever, that how they interpreted music or in how they live their lives. Sure, okay. So with Florence Price, uh, I think what makes her extraordinary is not just what she achieved in the you know very male dominated um, classical mainstream, but the fact that she was part of a network of women, I think that that, not that that is groundbreaking, but that is really significant because in classical music, we have a tendency to mm. um, take these individual figures like Bach, Beethoven, et cetera, and to just sort of isolate them from their reality, to put them on pedestals as if they're gods, you know, infallible. Um, and, but they were human beings and they were human beings that needed other human beings. And this is what makes Florence Price's story so incredible is the fact that that is, it's not something that she ever plays down in her career. And I think as we, you know, enjoy this uh, revival of her, of her music, of life and legacy, we must recognize that what makes her so extraordinary is that she was part of this era that was led by women who were just as talented and capable as her. The Chicago Symphony might not have played their works, but that is no reflection on what these women were capable of. So mm. that's what inspires me with Florence Price. With Margaret Bonds, um, what inspires me is how she takes what she learned from the Chicago Black Renaissance. So I think of her as a daughter of the Black Chicago Renaissance because she's a little, well, she's 26 years younger than Florence Price. So she's absorbing the lessons from all of these incredible matriarchs. Mm -hmm. And then she puts that into her music. And as you could hear in that piece that I was playing, there's a certain fire in her music that I don't hear in Florence Price's because I Price is from an earlier generation. She's a bit more conservative, but Bonds, you know, she's, there's a fire and Later in life, she really um, gets involved with the civil rights movement, you know, so I, I what yeah what's inspiring and interesting about Margaret Bonds is how she represents that next generation. Mm -hmm. um, Nora Holt, uh, I am absolutely in love with her because <laughs> she is a woman who just lives by her own rules, you know, married five times um, in, you know, in an environment where she just wore her husband's out, huh? just wore him out. <laughs> 
Uh, well, you know, if they couldn't support her lifestyle, she was on got to the... go. Exactly. You got to go, brother. <laughs> <laughs> and she lived uh, an incredible life. Um, she was a classical composer, but mm-hmm. she was a nightclub singer. And um, the Prince of Wales, King Edward VIII, was one of her biggest fans. He would shower her with gifts. Um, you know, she was she was up there with high society. She was close friends with Josephine Baker. This is a woman that we we need to know more about because she was living an incredible life. And I, I think that's also important in terms of just telling Black women's stories in a broader way, you know, mm successful black women don't have to be respectable <laughs> um in that sort of victorian <laughs> sense and i i, I think i just that. found my t-shirt <laughs> successful black women don't have to be respectable <laughs> okay respected but not respectable uh, you know? ah, key distinction key distinction <laughs> um and i love that about nora holt because it you know, we yes, we have these conservative women like Florence Price, who sort of lived a little bit more by society's rules. Then we have these women by no, like Nora Holt, who shattered those rules. But mm-hmm. these women were also friends as well. So it's not an either or. Right, this is the right. same community. Right. Um, Helen Hagen, you know, she's a trailblazer studying mm-hmm. at Yale in 1912 having um, a successful career in Europe as well. Um, and I, I love that international dynamic. Um, around these women's stories, because it, Uh, again, it just gives us, um, you know, a a broader understanding of, of, you know, early 20th century Black women's lives. You know, there there is no fixed um, livelihood for a mm -hmm. Black woman at this time that, you know, there are possibilities despite the hostile racial climate. Um, And what I love about Betty Jackson King is that her, her legacy is still felt Um, so strongly. There are people in Chicago who are part of the National Association of Negro Musicians, of which Mm. Betty Jackson King was president, and they they were friends with her. They, she taught them, you know, she, her, her legacy, while it might not be as international as Florence Price's, is still incredibly powerful because Chicago, as you know, is such an important creative hub. Um, It, changes so much um, about the broader right. American cultural landscape. And Betty Jackson King is at the heart of that. Ah, thank, thank you. Thank you for that, for that panoramic view and that sweep of all the, of these five incredible, incredible Black women. And you mentioned about the Chicago Black Renaissance, 1930s to 1940s. Um, I did grow up in Chicago, as I said, and it, it was very, very influential there. We, we knew about Florence, Florence Price's um, school that was in the Kenwood area there and and it produced a lot of a lot of it was also music and and was a was a huge huge part of that and with the chicago renaissance there were a lot of writers who came out of that as well margaret walker was one of them richard wright gwendolyn brooks who later on i like to say was my first poetry teacher in 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 third grade and she was a part of part of that but there were all these also great musicians that you mentioned as well and bonds was a part of that and florence price when she went there it seemed that she grew um as a result she went she she came here to new england she went to, to new england a conservatory um, it was interesting when I was reading up on her that that she had to, um, in order for, for her to get taught and for her to not suffer from the prejudices that, that, that were of the day, she had to pretend to be Mexican. Yes. Right? She had to pretend to be Mexican. Uh, mm-hmm. In order just 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 to get the education. And I also think about like, just to be able to work with some of the mentors who were here, that what we would have lost. Right. What we it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a painful thing. Had she claimed her true identity, what we would have never have gotten. Right. But because she did not claim her true identity, we've got so much from her. And it always sets up the idea of, of what what do we get if we allow people to be who they are and bring their full authentic selves to what it is that they do? And, and what have we as a human species missed out on because of our own narrowness? And, and, and you're helping to sort of open us up to that for those out, out here who don't know of the history of black women in classical music. And Florence Price, of course, is, is, is up there and she's a gem with that. But next, we're gonna play something from uh, Florence Price as, as you interpreted it. It is a French name, so if you could help me with that. I will not say it because my, my wife grew up here and she speaks French as well. And I do not want to have this argument at the dinner table <laughs> and get browbeaten for how I say it wrong. So if you could say the title of the next thing we're going to listen to. 
This is Florence Price's Fantasy Negre number two in G minor. Number what she said, number two <laughs> in, in G minor. Is there anything you want to set us up for so we might better understand what we're going to be experiencing? So Florence Price wrote four of these fantasies for solo piano. And the first one is based directly on a spiritual, but the others are based on her evocations of spirituals. And this one in particular, I feel is the most introspective. I feel like this is the most sort of emotional and intense that I, I've ever heard Florence Price. Mm, um, mm. So it, it gives us just a window into that, you know, interiority. Um, uh, and this is also my favorite one. <laughs> okay. So it has that added thing as well. Thank you. Thank you for giving us that, for guiding us with that. Um, if uh, we can get that video clip up of uh, Samantha playing Florence Price, here we go.
I got to be honest with you. I've seen this, this video probably six, eight times now. It never gets old. <laughs> you know, the music, I, every time I go through it, I'm like, is, is there any emotion that I have that has been left untouched? You know, by what's happening with this. And that's a combination, of course, of price and your and your interpretation of, of what price is doing. Thank you for that, for that gift. It is a joy to 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 watch. I've listened to it in the car and I've looked at it on my computer. And it's it's a joy to both just just close one's eyes and also just hear it, but also to see it. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> sure. I, I, I've noticed something whenever I've, I've seen your, your your clips and what you've done. And what I've noticed is that there's rarely, if any, any musical sheets out. Right. And, and that indicates that, that that the music has has gotten into you. You are a repository of this music. Right. Not not necessarily reading it, but also feeling it. And and, and that it becomes a physical, a physical part of you. Um, how do you go about connect to, to connecting to music so much to this music so much that it gets inside inside of you? Uh, what is it that makes that determination? Oh, I see some of the questions down there. I'll be asking those too. So what is it What is it that makes that determination, whether you let um, a, a, a tune or a music or musician enter you physically in that way, enter you? Well, it's it begins with the music first. Um, so actually this this does overlap with, um, with Price, with Deborah's question. You can, a, you about, can ask the question. Her about question is- Price. So yeah, I think, I mean, it would cover um, Deborah's answer. Sure. I first heard, the first piece that I ever heard by Black Women Composer was Florence Price's Fantasy Negre, number one in E minor. I didn't know who Florence Price was. I didn't know what Fantasy Negre in E minor was. <laughs> but when I heard this music, it's just, it's so difficult to put into words, but I just spent the rest of that day listening to that music on repeat. I was at- um, Well, I told you I did six or, yeah. six or eight times. I'm like, whoa, I gotta yes. hear this again. Um, this was during my undergraduate study at McGill um, in Canada. And I, you know, it clearly had a professor who knew how important it was that this music reach her students. She didn't know that uh, I would be one of her students. And at some point this whole thing would become my life. Um, but I just heard this music and I had never heard anything like it. I, I'd never heard Black music in classical music in a way that felt real and authentic. You know, I know that George Gershwin is praised for what he does um, with jazz and, and, you know, the European style. But that, as much as I think it's fun, that's never really resonated with me right. on a deeper level. Um, Trying to think of who else. I, I also cite um, the French composer Debussy, who um, had a very racist approach to using black mm. music. Um, and but I mean, his music is still taught, um, despite mm -hmm. the fact that it's, you know, anti-black in its aesthetic. Mm -hmm. um, with Florence Price, you know, I, I even though the spirituals are not a sent, uh, are not a part of my cultural not a part of my immediate cultural heritage. I'm of Nigerian background, I'm of Jamaican background as well. But it was that folk music that just, it was just so powerful. And then I heard um, Troubled Water, which is based on Wade in the Water. And that was a spiritual I did know. Um, and it, there are times when I listen to it and it just brings me to tears. There have been times when I've been playing Margaret Bond's Troubled Water and I'm just very emotional just thinking about what, the, the original context and the original meanings of that mm -hmm. song. And just to be playing it today, it feels like an honor to, to be able to be a vehicle for this history to you know continue to be told. So the, it's just something about the music that just gets into me, like mm -hmm. just into my soul and I cannot let it go. It's right. obsessive. Um, and um, I've had that with uh, the Czech composer on my first album, Vyacheslava Kaprilova. Um, I I just heard her music and then I learned that she died at the age of 25. And that oh, really wow. hit me. Yeah, it really hit me because I was in my, I was around the same age um, and had been through challenges um, and experiences where um, I heard her music and I was just so grateful for life. Um, and mm, mm. And when I play her music, 
that's the part of my story that I'm telling, you know, a story where things didn't almost didn't turn out this way. Um, you know, and I, I'm grateful to be alive and to do what I do. So it's just, it, it just gets into me in a way that is, it's not academic. I can't write about this. I can't always put it into words. <laughs> right. But once that music is there, it's within me. And as a soloist as well, I will always play from memory because I do feel that this is not going to be the same for every pianist. But for me personally, if I can do it from memory, it means I really know it. And if I make mm. a mistake, well, I say if, when I make a mistake, <laughs> um, <laughs> I trust myself to get back on track. I can do it. Um, so it, it, yeah, it's it's just such a personal thing. And I feel like to have the music in front of me sort of breaks that connection. It's like if you went to see a play and all the actors had their scripts, you know, right. the, the acting might still obviously be very strong, but you would feel... Yes, a, a, a know, bit of a, a partition barrier. between between yes. the two of you, right? It's not embodied. Yeah. It's not that's embodied. It. That's it, and that's that's what I want to convey. Um, especially because you know these women are underrepresented, and I feel like um, to play from memory is to sort of, for me personally, again, because not all pianists feel this way, and I think that's absolutely fine. But for me personally, what I'm showing is that you know if I were to play a Beethoven sonata, it would be expected that I would do it from memory. So I want to bring that. Um, that you know, sense of high standard to these lesser known and underrepresented women composers. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, let me see if we do have a question so I can, because we're coming up on time. I just want to make sure, do we see yes. a question in there? Uh, do you see a question there at all that I'm just trying to look at it? I don't really see it, but someone asked about Price's music, which is which yes, is great. That was okay. Deborah. Okay, that was that was Deborah. Um, then I want us to move maybe into the the very last piece that you've given us to present today, the last selection, and this is from a composition by the, the as we might call her, the inimitable Nora Holt, and this one is called Negro Dance. I, I can pronounce that. And um, in the promo, you mentioned uh, her, that Holt um, with her modern life, and you did give us a, a bit about that, but this piece you're gonna give us, right? You were saying that, um, that we wouldn't have it if it weren't for her having to publish it in something herself. Yes. So when she returned from studying with the esteemed, um, um, pedagogue uh, Nadia Boulanger in the 1930s. This was a, a woman that so many big names studied with, Stravinsky, Aaron Copeland, mm, the biggest mm. names in classical music. And Nora Holt was there. So that, that really tells us a lot about how incredible ah, she was. Right. But she came back to the States and a suitcase full of her compositions had just been ransacked. And clearly oh. she, she just moved on from that and she didn't pursue composition any further. And I can imagine, you know, that would have been a devastating loss. But the pieces that we have today are pieces that she published in a journal that she founded called Music and Poetry. What an amazing and perfect yeah. combination. <laughs> <laughs> agreed, agreed. Um, and, you know, I've, I've thought about, you know, this Negro dance. It's, uh, it's a word that, um, especially, you know, my white colleagues are going to be very uncomfortable saying. Um, because of that history. But I didn't want to change the name. Or I didn't want to censor. I didn't want to silence it and not include that. This is history. This happened. You know, this right. word exists. And mm -hmm. what Nora Holt does is she says, I am proud of my history. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of my heritage. And this piece champions that. It celebrates that. Um, and she would play this piece to young Black um girls and boys in Chicago mm -hmm. as part of that uplift. So yes, it, it might make some people uncomfortable, but you know what? Get uncomfortable because that's <laughs> the history. And that's, that's it. If we don't play this piece, we don't get to hear that glimpse into who Nora Holt was as a composer. Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, and getting back to that part about self-advocacy, as, as, as you were saying, right? You know, um, she did it herself, right? Um, 
people won't put this up or they won't publish this, I'll publish this. I'll make this happen. And I'll put it in a book. And I, and I look for, for music and poetry by Nora Holt and there are references to it, but I can't, maybe it's somewhere in some, in some uh, library, but I can't find, I couldn't find anything of it online. I was thinking maybe it's been reprinted. I'd love to have a, to have a copy of it or something like that, uh, but I couldn't find, find it anywhere. I'd be curious to know where you found it. We can talk about this afterwards, but I'd really like to know that. So, uh, with that being said, we are going to put up the clip of Negro Dance by Nora Holt. And um, hope you all enjoy this. And then we'll have some more time with uh, Dr. Ege. First off, killer dress. <laughs> okay, and 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 the shoes. <laughs> you, know, you 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 was killing it. You know you was killing it, right? You know, um, the thing every time I see that piece that always gets me is how you're going through it. You're concentrating on on playing the notes because this is a faster tune, right? And you're doing your thing, but it's this huge grin that you have at the end and this sort of sway that you do <laughs> to the side right and I'm like oh sister is loving this <laughs> and, and, and I was like you you look like you were experiencing such such joy is is that right it's true I mean <laughs> I initially I thought oh I don't think I want that to be uh captain maybe we should do another take but <laughs> You know, I got dressed up. I wanted to enjoy that 1920s aesthetic. Um, yeah. And it's a fun piece. And I got to the end and I was just like, this is really fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, yeah, this is really fun. And I'm so lucky that I get to do this, you know. And um, and actually, initially, I, I would just make those videos so that mm -hmm. people could see this music. And, you know, there was... That video wasn't for for anything. That was just, you know, for access for, for people to see it. And so, you know, I might as well might as well have fun with it. But you could see the more serious face on the the Oxford video from before because <laughs> that was more work. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, this this was probably your you, you know um, you just haven't having a good time and just allow it to play. And and that's that's one of the things uh, in our earlier conversations that we've had um, away from Zoom. You were speaking about about with with these women in particular, how for them music was a communal experience. Right. It was not just a solo that they were playing, but for them, it was meant to be shared. It was a communal experience. Is there more maybe you can say about that? And, and maybe if uh, if there's a difference that you see amongst classical musicians today. But I'd like to, to, to you to take us into that idea of the communal, the communality of music. 
Yes, I mean, as, as a musician, I am doing more collaborative works myself, playing with other musicians um, and wanting to, to seek out more um, classical pianists of African descent like myself, um, because I, I still feel this sense in which, um, in which there aren't many. But mm. as Florence, you know, as Florence Price teaches us, we can't have that approach and say, oh, there just aren't many black classical pianists, there aren't many black classical composers. Because when we look into Florence Price's life, when we spend the time to dig deeper, we find a whole network of hundreds and hundreds of African-American musicians. And so in my experience, especially in the UK, um, at the moment, I'm, you know, still seeking um, broader communities, but, you know, just because um, I haven't found that broad, broader community as yet, there's no reason for me to say, oh, well, you know, there aren't any, you know, <laughs> black musicians. They don't exist. In the UK. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so I, I want that um, sense of community to be a part of how I operate because it makes me a better musician, it makes me a better scholar as well. Um, I would say as a scholar, definitely, I have an incredible, um, an incredibly diverse community around me. And, you know, that's what makes my work strong, because I have that. Um, and so that's why I'm seeking that as I continue to grow as a pianist, because there is, as Florence Price teaches us, there is great value in having that support system. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And there's also been great value in spending this time with you. Thank you. Um, hopefully it's been that way for you as well. And I'm absolutely. so glad that we were able to bring you here, albeit digitally, uh, in order to to uh, apprise us and, and, and actually bring us to a different space. I think you've done for us in this time. And, and also from what I've seen in your interviews and from what I've heard in your music, the five things that I always say, I, I love it when performers do, and that is to engage, get the attention, entertain, keep the attention, affect to move us, educate, to teach us and then elevate to bring us into a higher space. And I certainly think through, through everything I've seen of you, you have done that and will continue to do so. So thank you so much for spending this, this hour of time with us. Thank you. Thank you for those incredibly beautiful and moving words. And um, thank you everyone for, for spending time with me, for listening to this music, to listening to my various stories and reflections. And um, unfortunately there, there have been delays with getting this um, CD out, but it's coming, don't worry, it's coming. Okay. I have a copy right here, so it's real. <laughs> it's an actual thing. <laughs> She's not faking us, okay? Now, if you wanna know more, you can also go on to Dr. Ege's website, which is Samantha Ege, E-G-E dot -E com. There you can also purchase her other albums as well and i recommend you do it is great listening and you can find out all about uh, yes for women and you can find out all about about where uh, dr Age will be appearing next and who she will be appearing with and um trust me on this you want to follow her career and and um it'll be good for you for for your soul so thanks again to the ABCL, the Association of Black um, Citizens of Lexington, for being in partnership with, um, with our great resource, the Cary Memorial Library. And thanks to Cary Memorial Library for allowing this hour to happen for us. Everyone, thank you. Enjoy yourselves, be safe, and have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Goodbye, everyone.